Just like now during the season of Pascha, uh, we say to each other, Christ is risen, and the response is, truly he is risen, or Christos Anesti, and the response is, Alikos Anesti. During the season of, uh, of the Nativity of Christ, the season of Christmas, it's customary for people to say to one another, Christ is born, and then the response is glorified. And now I, I asked, when I was taking Greek classes at the seminary, we talked to our Greek professor about that phrase and how you say it in, in, in Greek. And she said, in Greece, this is not something people do. In other words, according, according to her, it's something that we kind of made up as Orthodox Christians here, here in America, using that response as a, as a back and forth greeting. But I like that. I think it's nice. So we say, Christ is born, glorify him. Christos yenate doxasate. That's what it is in, in, in Greek. What are we celebrating today? We're celebrating something that's very often misunderstood. Because if you were to look at what we're taught about Christmas in Christmas songs, in Christmas movies, on TV, all these sorts of things, you're going to hear a lot of nice, feel-good messages. You're going to hear about how Christmas is all about family, for example. And family, of course, is a wonderful part of Christmas. Being able to spend time with your family is one of, one, of, one of the most important things of Christmas. But it's not the purpose of Christmas. It's not the meaning of Christmas. You'll hear if you listen to Christmas songs and Christmas movies about how much better it is to give than to receive. And that's definitely true. It's certainly a more blessed thing to give than it is to receive. But once again, giving gifts is not the purpose of Christmas, as wonderful as it might be. Receiving gifts certainly is not the point, the purpose of Christmas, as wonderful as that might be as well. What's the meaning, the purpose of Christmas? The nativity, the birth of our Lord and God and Savior Jesus Christ. That's the one and only meaning, purpose, reason for existence that Christmas has. When I think about the nativity story that we read in the Gospels, I think about the fact that throughout the history of salvation, God was sending faithful people, faithful men and women, into situations where they didn't exactly know what was going to happen. Into situations where they didn't know how things were going to pan out exactly. And they had to trust in faith that the things that God had planned for them would come to pass as God had told them. What do I mean here? I'm talking about Abraham, for example. Abraham, who was told by God, you need to leave the land that you've grown up in. You need to leave your, your father's house. And you need to go to the land that I'm going to show you. And Abraham sets out with obedient faith, not even knowing where he's going to end up, but he knows that God is going to lead him to the place that God has prepared for him. I think also about the people of Israel when they were freed from their slavery in Egypt. Once again, God told them, I have a place for you, a place for you to inherit. And you need to trust me, you need to follow me. And the people of Israel obediently, some of them, some of them weren't all that obedient about it. But most of them obediently trusted and had faith and followed what God was saying to them. Even though they had to wander in the desert for 40 years before they finally reached the place God had given them as an inheritance. Imagine 40 years in the desert. They didn't know what was going to happen, but they believed in faith that what God had said would come to pass would in fact come to pass. How does this fit in with the Nativity story? What happens in the Nativity story? A young woman married who had been raised in a temple dedicated to God is betrothed, not married, but betrothed to an old man named Joseph who had agreed to protect her since she was no longer in an age where she could live in the temple. He receives her into his care and then Mary is visited by the archangel who gives her the good news, the evangelium, the good news that she is going to bear our Lord and God and Savior Jesus Christ, who is the Son, not of Joseph, but the Son of God through the power of the Holy Spirit. And what does Mary say? Does Mary worry about, oh, how is this going to happen? And she says, let it be to me according to your will. She has obedient faith and trust that even if she doesn't understand how it's going to happen, that what God has said will come to pass, in fact, will come to pass. Now, Joseph learns that his betrothed is married, is, is, uh, is pregnant now. 
And what goes through his mind? He thinks, well, I know that I haven't been with, with Mary, so she must have been with somebody else. She's gotten pregnant from somebody else. I need to quietly get her out of my life. She can't, she can't be a part of my life anymore. And then he is visited by the Archangel, who explains to him what's happening, who explains to him that this child is the child of the Holy Spirit, and says to him, do not be afraid. Do not be afraid to take Mary to be your wife. And what does Joseph do? He doesn't understand necessarily everything, but he trusts that what the archangel told him is the truth. Maybe he doesn't understand what's going on completely. And in fact, in many of the hymns we've sung this week at different services, you see Joseph being very confused as they're going to Bethlehem together, not quite understanding what's going on, but still believing, still having faith because he's heard from the archangel. And then when he sees our Lord and God and Savior Jesus Christ being born, that faith that was based on trust, that faith that was based on the word of the archangel becomes a faith that's based on experience, becomes a faith that moves from his head into his heart. And he confesses that this is the Son of God, the Lord, the Savior, Jesus Christ, who has come to save us from our sins. So what do Mary and Joseph do now? There's a census. The first census in the entire Roman world a census. Everybody has to go back to the city where they're from. Now, Joseph is descended from David, and so he goes to the city where David's from. That's Bethlehem. He goes to Bethlehem, and when they show up, they can't find room anywhere. We know the story. There's no room in the inn. And they go from place to place, from, from, from inn to inn. Nobody has any room for them. Again, they've come into a situation where they don't know what's going to happen. They don't know how things are going to pan out, but they believe in faith that God will make a way for them. And finally, one of the innkeepers says, I have room in my stable. You can stay in my stable. Now, some people get confused because you read in the gospel that the nativity of Jesus Christ happened in a stable. And so we picture a barn on our heads. And a lot, lots of Christmas cards have a kind of a barn on them. But it wasn't a barn, it was a cave. You hear that in lots of hymns for the nativity of Christ, that Christ was born in a cave. In that day, in that area, people who owned plots would keep their plots in caves. So the caves were their stables. They would build stables into caves. So don't get confused if you've seen the gospel, a stable, and then you've seen some of our hymns, a cave. It's the same thing. The cave was the stable. They go to this cave, this stable, and Mary gives birth to our Lord and God and Savior Jesus Christ. And my favorite part of the Holy Nativity story is the shepherds. Because we read that there were shepherds in the area around Bethlehem. And if you go to the Holy Lands, you can visit a small monastery called the Monastery of the Shepherds. And it's the exact place where these shepherds were when they were visited by the angels, who proclaimed to them the good news that the Savior was born, that the Messiah was being born that very night that the king was being born that very night. And so they go, the shepherds, to the cave, to the stable, and they see Mary and Joseph, and they see Jesus, and they worship this newborn child who has come to save his creation. Now, when you think about the Christmas season, probably the image that comes to mind is Jesus Christ as a baby. And lots of prayers and hymns that you hear around Christmas focus on the Christ child, the little, the little baby Jesus Christ. And in most Western churches, churches, that's the emphasis. Certainly in the Catholic Church and lots of Protestant churches, all of the hymns, everything, it's all about the little baby Christ. And that's, there's nothing wrong with that approach to Christmas. But if you look at the, the hymns that we sing in the Orthodox Church for the Nativity of Christ, it doesn't focus on Jesus Christ as a little baby. The hymns that we sing focus on Jesus Christ as the light of the world who has come to bring light to darkness. It's not focused on Jesus Christ, the little human child. It's focused on Jesus Christ, the Savior of our souls, the Son of God, the light of the world who has come to redeem us, to save us, to enlighten us, and to set us free from our sins. So I want to encourage you today, I know that 
We're going to go home and we're all going to celebrate with our families. We're going to have a wonderful uh, Christmas, um, doing all the wonderful Christmas things we tend to do. Lots of food, lots of gifts. I'm sure all of this is waiting at home for all of you. But remember as you're celebrating today that the purpose of our celebration on the Feast of Christmas, the Feast of the Nativity of our Lord, is not about family, even though family is a wonderful, crucial part of Christmas. The purpose of Christmas is not about giving gifts, let alone receiving gifts, even though giving is a wonderful, blessed, glorious thing. The purpose of the Feast of Nativity is not about the huge table full of turkey or duck or ham or whatever it might be. Those are all wonderful parts about Christmas. But Christmas, the Nativity of Christ, has one purpose, one meaning, one reason for its existence, and that is the birth of our Lord and God and Savior, Jesus Christ. So thank you so much for being with us this morning. May our God and Savior, who is born on this day, guide you and bless you throughout your life.